Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, uh, today is the sixth uh, session on neoplasia, uh, where I will be discussing two very important hallmarks of cancer that is stained angiogenesis and invasion and metastasis. Okay, just to go back to this uh, picture which shows uh, the hallmarks of cancer, we have already learnt about a self-sufficient growth signaling. Uh, insensitivity to growth inhibitory signals and uh, in our subsequent lectures I will also be talking about uh, genomic instability and tumor immunity. But today we will uh, talk about angiogenesis, invasion and metastasis. Now any tumor uh, will require uh, nutrition and oxygen for it to be able to grow continuously. And although all the genetic mechanisms are in place to make it into a cancerous uh, tumor, it will still require these additional support of nutrition and oxygen for it to continue to grow. It can grow only up to 1 or 2 millimeters uh, before it can you know, it'll run out of uh, uh, oxygen and uh, nutrition. So, it requires that it, it develops its own vasculature so that there is a continuous supply of nutrition and oxygen for it to grow. Now, angiogenesis therefore is an absolute requirement for tumor growth. Now, how do tumors achieve this? Tumors themselves stimulate neoangiogenesis. This is because they have, they release from their cells and also the stromal cells many of the growth factors that are required for angiogenesis. And the new vessels that are formed with the endothelial cells themselves secrete additional growth factors which encourages more angiogenesis and also the growth of the tumor. Now, angiogenesis not only supplies the required nutrition and oxygen to the growing tumor cells, it also contributes to metastasis. Now, this is an example uh, taken from a highly malignant uh, sarcoma and all the spindle cells that you are seeing in this picture are um, uh, malignant cells um, they, because they have a lot of mitotic activity, they are rapidly growing, that is an indication that they are rapidly growing. But you also see in the, uh, in the center, right to the center, right of the center you see a large area. Uh, where there are no cells, where, where it is only pink and that area is the area of necrosis. Now, even when angiogenesis is very effective in very rapidly growing tumors, you see these areas of necrosis because the blood supply is unable to match the rapid growth of the tumor. So, necrosis present in any malignant tumor indicates that it is uh, an aggressive kind of a tumor which is growing very fast. Now, what are the factors influencing angiogenesis? Now, there are pro-angiogenic factors and anti-angiogenic factors. So, it is actually a balance between promoters and inhibitors and somewhere there is a switch towards promotion of angiogenesis. And this switch occurs within tumors so that the, the promoters gain uh, an upper hand over the inhibitors. Now, what triggers these angiogenesis? Hypoxia could be a factor which triggers angiogenesis through the action of certain uh, molecules such as H HIF1 alpha, which then leads to transcription of a growth factor known as VEGF. And mutations involving certain tumor suppressor genes and onc oncogenes tilt the balance in favor of angiogenesis. Now, this property of the growth factors being involved in angiogenesis is exploited for cancer therapy because now we have VEGF inhibitors that are used to treat a number of cancers. 
With those few words about angiogenesis, let us move on to another very important related topic that is invasion and metastasis. Invasion and metastasis is one of the most important hallmarks of malignancies and it is a major cause of morbidity and mortality due to cancer. Now imagine if the cancer is restricted to the organ, one can always treat it because that part of the organ can be removed. But if it has already spread to distant organs all over the body, it is almost impossible to contain it just by surgery. So this is the property of cancer that makes it very difficult to treat and also the treatment becomes very toxic because uh, in, in the bargain of killing these uh, tumor cells which have gone through the entire body, you are also going to end up killing a lot of normal cells. Now we have already studied how uh, cancers spread. Uh, they can either seed within the body cavities like how you see in ovarian carcinomas or they can spread via lymphatics like how you see in epithelial tumors or carcinomas or they may spread through blood like how you normally see in sarcomas. Now these are not like you know the only mechanisms uh, for instance ovarian cancers can also spread by lymphatics and bloodstream, uh, carcinomas can also spread by the hematogenous route and sarcomas rarely can also spread by the lymphatic route. Now this is a diagram uh, which I will also draw on the board uh, which shows the metastatic cascade by which we mean uh, the entire process in which the normal uh, the, the, the tumor cells um, uh, detach themselves from the primary tumor, get into the bloodstream, go to a distant organ and then uh, plant an implant uh, or a metastatic deposit in that distant organ. Now you imagine, uh, let us take a breast carcinoma for example and let us imagine that these are cells of the breast carcinoma, the tumor cells. Let us put. Now, as we know, cancers continuously evolve, and um, uh, uh, people believe there are two theories about how metastatic, metastatic cells develop. Some people believe that the metastatic potential is there from the very beginning of a, the growth of a tumor. So, even as the tumor is uh, you know very small, it already has a metastatic potential. But some others believe that the metastatic potential comes somewhere down the line when metastatic subclones develop. Now the truth may be anywhere between the two of these, both these processes may be involved in a metastasis. Uh, but for now let us imagine a metastatic subclone develops within this tumor as the tumor evolves. So let us show it in LO, the metastatic subclone which has an increased ability to uh, in, invade and metastasize and these are all resting as you know on a basement membrane. These are all resting on a basement membrane. So as long as the tumor is contained within the bas basement membrane, is it, it is a carcinoma in situ which means it has still not encountered blood vessels and it is not going to uh, uh, metastasize. Now once it acquires the ability to invade this basement membrane, so the first process is invasion of basement membrane, invasion of basement membrane. It can break away, the cells can break away, invade the basement membrane and get into the extracellular matrix. Now what you see here is all extracellular matrix. Now the cells should also have the ability to move within the extracellular matrix and get into the blood vessels. Let us show the blood vessel like this. So there is a blood vessel here, they have to move within the ECM and then reach the blood vessel. And here they have to invade, invade the wall of the blood vessel, they have to intravasate into the wall of the blood vessel and get into the lumen 
and start circulating. Now, usually they form clumps or emboli within the lumen. They can even get attached to normal cells within the blood vessels, the lymphocytes. They can attach, form emboli, they can attach to platelets and they move to all organs. And somewhere down the line, they may find a suitable organ. Let us uh, presume it is, uh, because we have started with breast, let us presume this is a lung that it encounters the lung and then it finds it suitable. So, then they need to extravasate into this organ, the cells come out and they find this environment suitable, they start growing here and they form new blood vessels here because they cannot keep on growing without blood vessels. We saw in angiogenesis that they need blo new blood vessels. They have found the blood vessels, they have found the environment suitable, though so they form a metastatic deposit here. Now, this may sound like a very you know simple process, but just imagine um, the cells need to acquire abilities to break the basement membrane. It needs to acquire the ability to transfer itself through the ECM and then break the wall of the vessel, get into the vessel and survive within the vascular environment because as you know there are a lot of immune cells that are circulating in the uh, blood vessels. So, they evade this immune mechanism and then they survive, they get into a, a, a secondary organ which is suitable and there they develop blood vessels again uh, so that they are fed with the nutrition and oxygen to be able to survive in the new environment. Now, this is a very highly complex process. It involves a lot of molecules. Uh, I will just show you a few molecules that are important in this uh, uh, metastatic cascade. So, let us break this up into four steps. The first step is the cells have to detach from each other. As you know, the epithelial cells are in close contact with each other and these are held close to each other by molecules called E cadherins. Now, first these cells in order to be able to detach from each other should lose the E cadherins. So, that is the first step in the ability to invade and metastasize. And then they have to uh, have uh, molecules which will degrade the extracellular matrix and some of these molecules are matrix metalloproteinases and cathepsins. Now, they need then need to attach to these new ECM components, move through the ECM or extracellular matrix and then migrate into the um, uh, blood vessel and then move on to the secondary site. Now, millions of tumor cells may be actually being shed into the blood stream when a tumor is growing and uh, they circulate as I told you either as single cells or as emboli and a lot of these may be getting destroyed by immune cells and we have now know the concept of tumor dormancy which means there are these cells circulating in the vascular uh, uh, vasculature and only when they get the sufficient uh, support from the stromal cells of the target organ then they start growing and um, uh, start becoming a metastatic deposit. Now, sites of metastasis. Sites of metastasis are determined by anatomic location and vascular drainage of primary tumor. Now, what do you mean by this? Suppose it is a malignant breast carcinoma. The first site of metastasis would be naturally be the, the lymphatic drainage of the breast which is to the axillary lymph nodes. So, it is determined by the location and the vascular drainage. Now, it also depends on the tropism of the um, particular tumors for certain sites. Now, we now know that uh, uh, for example, the lung cancers metastasize to adrenal, they metastasize to bone. Prostate cancer typically metastasizes to bone. So, why, why this affinity for certain organs? These could be de determined actually by adhesion molecules and chemokines which are expressed on the tumor cells and the target organ. Now, the tumor cells may also have chemokine receptors, a very important one being CXCR4 that may be responsible for this tropism. 
Now, although some sites are very highly vascular like the skeletal muscle and spleen, they are not preferred sites for metastasis probably because there is a micro environment within these uh, organs which are unsuitable for metastasis. So, they are termed as unfavorable soil for metastasis. Now, you can see uh, the devastating effect of metastasis in this autopsy specimen of liver where you have seen a metastatic tumor. All those white nodules you are seeing have almost completely replaced the parent organ. So, this probably from the GI tract which is a common uh, uh, tumors which uh, metastasize to the liver. Okay, in summary, invasion and metastasis are the most important hallmarks of cancer because these are the two processes that lead to a lot of morbidity and mortality in cancer and they are very complex processes and they involve a huge lot of molecular mechanisms. Thank you.